Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey, everybody. Today, I'm talking to Celia Grand. Celia and I spend about 15 minutes talking about EMDR and IFS. We talk about parts and attachment wounds, trauma, and how self heals parts. And then most of the rest of the podcast, Celia talks a little bit about her retreat, and then we do a lot of practice. And so I really hope that you join us as we practice breathing, as we practice moving bodies, as we practice moving our hands. I think there's enough instruction that you can practice along. There's a little bit of heady stuff at the beginning and lots of fun, really practical stuff from about 15 minutes on. I also added some music because this one's a little bit longer than the other ones, and I hope it helps with the pacing. I hope you all are doing really well. I love hearing from you on Instagram at IFS Tammy and on the Facebook page, The One Inside. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Take care. Why don't you start by just telling everybody a little bit about who you are and how you came to be? Okay. So I'm Celia Grand. I'm in private practice um, in in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and uh, I've been a therapist uh, outpatient since 1988, but in the field, believe it or not, since 1978. I know it's crazy. I started off in undergrad in 1978, worked group homes and uh, schools and stuff like that, and then worked for schools, worked for a school, uh, an emotionally disturbed, a school for emotionally disturbed boys, and then I went to graduate school been outpatient since. But my early imprint, which really is informs IFS, was my first advanced training at a graduate school. And it was a method called psychosynthesis. And psychosynthesis talked about subpersonalities and parts of self, and that the self, which was ordinary consciousness, was both a witness to our experience and the part of us that experiences experience. And then it was a psycho-spiritual psycho model, which also activated the, what the Buddhists call the true self, or we would call it an IFS self-energy. But those are the positive qualities that we have just as human beings. So that method really informed my whole entire practice. Mm-hmm. I studied it for nine years and became certified in psychosynthesis. And meanwhile, in the mid-90s, I stumbled upon EMDR and what most people know me for. It was a very powerful therapy at the time for me, and it was new, and it was cutting edge. And by 1999, I became a facilitator with the EMDR Institute. Then I did the whole EMDR thing, and then I studied with Pat Ogden and became a certified sensory motor psychotherapy therapist. And that's where I learned to work in the body. So the early imprint of parts work, then the brain work, you know, working with neural networks and how information gets stored in our brains, and then working with the body. Then eventually what I did was I had heard about IFS in the 90s, uh, because it was very similar to psychosynthesis. And I still see the tenets of of uh, psychosynthesis in, probably Dick would not (laughs) agree with me, but the tenets of psychosynthesis, but I really studied that model for nine years, so I think I have the right to say it. And so I got trained, and I'm only level one trained in IFS, but because both in uh, sensory motor work and in the psychosynthesis, we worked with parts, and we worked with, uh, you know, how parts of ourselves, developmental wounding, land in our consciousness. And 
they get triggered at various times. And so we have, and the other piece too is in graduate school was uh, ego state therapy was very big in the eighties. And so ego state therapy was one of the models that I, and self, self psychology was two models that I learned in graduate school. So everything kind of fit together. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like, you know, you have all, all of these different models, but there's definitely some themes and some similarities between all these different models. How did you end up with, um, you know, I have a client and I think probably a lot of people feel this way that, you know, she'll come to me and we're talking about different things. And then she wants to go to do trauma work with EMDR. There seems to be this EMDR or IFS thing going around that I keep hearing about. So I'm curious for you, you were doing EMDR, you were a star in the EMDR world. In my world. In yeah. my little, <laughs> little world. I'm, the star. I'm gonna let me I think that you were a star. Let's just say Thank you. I, I think you were a star. So you were a star in that world. And what happened that you ended up deciding to get trained? Because that's where I met you. We did our level one. Mm-hmm. We did our level one. Well, I, you know, I um everybody was being trained in IFS and I actually learned about it when I was teaching for Pat Ogden, you know, about everybody was going to trainings and I had learned about IFS, like I said, in the nineties, but then it got very big in the two thousands. And honestly, I just couldn't do another training. I was teaching, and I was doing all these trainings. So it was really a timing issue for me to just get the level one training. It, mm-hmm. it was just, you know, I was ready. I had taken sort of a sabbatical from advanced training and teaching. And then it was just the timing of things that I went to IFS. But I think your question really is, um, I think it's a good one around EMDR versus IFS. And I, I think a good clinician should be able to assess what the client needs. But when someone comes into my office, I often talk about trauma having two branches. There's event trauma. That's something that happened to you. And then what's very big in the field and which really uh, affects most people is um, attachment trauma, developmental trauma, or relational trauma. Those are all interchanged. And when I talk about that type of trauma, developmental or attachment trauma, those are the things that didn't happen. So my friend Deirdre Fay has a transformational model that she has really honed and does really beautiful work with reframing those parts of ourselves that are sort of those annoying parts. She calls them, they protest. Underneath that are the developmental and attachment needs. And she's really honed in and getting what those attachment needs are. And then she has a model in learning how to work with your needs and getting what you want and what you long for. So that's the last arm of the work that I'm doing right now. And I have found that the developmental trauma really needs a little bit more uh, sort of holding, if you will. Mm. But in EMDR, you can work with attachment trauma And it really just depends on where you want to go. So if there's event trauma and developmental trauma, and it makes sense that we're really working with just a primary belief system, like um, a primary belief system, then that I assess and the client makes sense with me because I work collaboratively, that that's part of the neural network. So I'm doing my hand because this is such an EMDR thing. So we, we pick a, an experience and then... Yeah, um, just describe what you're doing with your hand. Right. So that's what I'm doing. So, so we, <laughs> this is the experience. But the brain, how, how the brain downloads information is through associations. We're adaptive in nature. Our brains are adaptive in nature. So if something happened to us, the components of experience go underground. Thoughts, beliefs, images, feelings, inner body sensation, uh, what else? Uh, Memory. 
And so what we're doing is when you do EMDR, you're bringing a person up into a triggered state. We're saying you had this experience. Now what's the belief you have about yourself? What are the images that go with that? What's the feelings? What's the inner body sensation? There's some pre and post scales. And then this is a triggered state. Then we let the brain just go down what we call channels of association. So I just want to describe what you're doing with your hand. So you have your hand. (laughs) So you have your hand um, so that you're pointing to like the outside palm of your hand. Right. Yeah. So this is the target. This is a triggered state. This is what people, when they get triggered, all the components of their experience that's now underground now comes up. And then the brain, because it's designed in its nature, to just go through different associations. And when we go down these associations, that's the deep part. We're dialing down the intensity of this experience. And the R part is that the belief is that the brain has its own curative nature. And when the brain goes from what was dysfunctionally stored, desensitized, up against a new belief system, then that juxtaposition, the brain will, what we call memory reconsolidation. It will consolidate. And then the symptoms that you, why we're doing EMDR, remits. IFS is a different model. It's like that information is stored, but because it's an ego state, I mean, I... I don't know about you, but I don't believe that we have little girls and little boys inside of us. <laughs> we have experiences. I like think that's heresy. That is heresy, you are saying. <laughs> but we use the language of parts because it's easy to yeah. say parts. And, and what we're saying is the same components of experience are lodged unconsciously and they get triggered. But instead of using it from a model of a neural network, right, from how the brain that neurobiology is is honing in what we're saying is let's let's go a softer approach in looking at this part of self this experience and ifs the greatest thing that i love about ifs is that what we're doing is building a self to part relationship so when in parts work the psychological term would be ego dystonic Meaning, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be shameful. I don't, that's not me. Yeah, and yeah. that those not me states. And so what we're saying is, let's have a relationship. Let's look at how we experience ourselves and how we can um, have a different relationship with ourselves. Does yes, that make sense? It totally makes sense. So tell me a little bit about what you mean by self to part. So the self in the understanding that I have that of um, the IFS world, but I also, because I have a Taoist and Buddhist uh, spiritual uh, backdrop, I believe that all of us are, we're born with sort of a purity of being a goodness and the higher qualities of being a human being, like compassion and love and presence and kindness and goodness, are natural states of being. And I think that that's what self energy is. But because of different experiences, we lose ourselves. And what we get in place are these stuck experiences in thoughts, feelings, inner body sensation. And that's a part. So for the self, it's remembering who you really are and then looking at your woundedness. You know, I have this angry part. How did I get angry? You were not born that way. Yeah. But something happened to you. So if something's happening to you, um, there is structural dissociation uh, folks talk about that at the moment of ex- trauma experiencing there's the part of the self that's going to hold all the components of the trauma, but the instinct and the will to go on with daily life, we un- uh, usurp that trauma and we go on with daily life. That's how things get stuck unconsciously until something comes along and triggers that and all of those components. So that's the part, the part comes up. 
And it's kind of a not me state. And the self is a me state. It's natural. It's, you know, fluid. But we forget ourselves over and over and over. And more trauma or earlier the trauma, the less developed the self will be. So would the not me state be like a part? Yes, that would be a part. So as the self is developing, right, we have this true nature, but our, how, we're, how we experience ourself somehow gets a little skewed at times. And that's where there's other parts that are like self-like parts. They're not the self, but they look good. They smell good. They sound good, but they're self-like. But it's only when we return to our true nature are we really in self. And so I think IFS, the beauty of IFS is learning how to open up to ourself and our self energy and use that energy to heal ourselves, heal those wounded parts of ourselves. Now, IFS is not the only model that does that. It really, you know, there's many models. It just is, it's sort of the way in which we um, decide to work. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I find that, um, you know, with EMDR, that's a pretty, it's protocol based and it's um, very specific. And so, and it's, if you do it right, I, I think the right ways to do a treatment plan. And the client and I are always in sort of a understanding where we are, right? But it's memory-based. Where the building of part-to-self relationship is really learning how to be on the inside and learning your own internal experiences. So some people aren't ready for EMDR when they come in because they don't know how to have what we call dual attention. And that's part of what IFS helps to do is build that dual attention. Yeah. But even with IFS, I found that people don't know how to be inside. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done, and we talked about this the, um, around my retreats, because I offer these day retreats that build in ways that practices that people can learn how to regulate their their emotions, how to work with their bodies, how to regulate their mind through um, meditation practices, through uh, movement practices, and more so in community because people don't have community. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to slow you down. Okay. I know I get so excited. I know. And I could be into you all day. Um, I'm going to slow you down and talk a little bit about, so you have these retreats and I want, we're going to get all the details about the retreats, but one of the first things that you do at these retreats is help people get comfortable with going inside. Mm -hmm. So talk about what that means, what that looks like. And even as the listeners right now are listening to this, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about something that they could even do. So when someone comes to a retreat, after everybody gets the hi, how are you? We sit in a circle and I usually do a meditation. And so that meditation, and it's usually a visualization, is really teaching people how to breathe. Uh, Most people don't know that their breath starts with their exhale. Everybody thinks it's their inhale, but your breath actually starts with your exhale. Wow. Okay. Okay. And most people don't know when people breathe, they usually breathe more from their chest. So so, um, I really teach them how to really start... So from Chinese medicine, I got to just, the the lower dantian is two inches below your navel. And that's the energy source of our scent. It's our center and it's where our vitality, our energy is stored. So you begin a very, very slow inhale. And in yoga, they call it the six-sided breathing, but you're bringing the breath up you're bringing it side to side and front to back so that the whole torso is like a bellow 
and it, and you you like I often direct people to fill up with breath and almost to their shoulder blades kind of pinch together, right? Like I'm doing it right now as you're talking. I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> I'm like standing up taller. <laughs> and then it's a very, very slow exhale where you start from like your collarbones and as you exhale, all that air drops down. And as the air drops down, you're softening your body, you're softening your core, you're releasing, you're letting go. So let's do it together and I'll, I'll um, do it with you. So put your mind into your lower dantian, into your belly, two inches below your navel. And begin to breathe in, inhaling very slowly, breathing up, all the way up your core, all the way up to your collarbones. Feel your breath expand out, forward and back, and pinch your shoulder blades together. And on your way down, just gently release letting go, softening your core, and releasing it down. And let's do it together. And this time, I'm going to do it with you and not talk it, okay? So let's inhale. Exhale. So I usually do that like three times. Like I'll, So I'll start a meditation with that deep breathing. I often do it with clients, and it's actually a really good tool. What it does is it regulates the central nervous system. So as when people come to the retreat or they're in therapy, or even if you're at home and you're all angsty because you've got some stuff you're sitting on, it's, it really like feeds two birds with one cracker, okay? So it regulates the central nervous system, and it teaches you how to be in your body because you it's a concentration practice. So you have to actually think. So your mind gets occupied. You mm -hmm. learn to be in your body and your breath regulates the central nervous system. And so just that simple tool of three very, very, very slow, deep, long breaths can really be a helpful tool for anybody who's on the call, you know, when they need a quick, a quick tool. And often, as you know, and when we're doing any kind of processing, if we slow the system down, we want, and that's the other piece, it slows the system down so that you're thinking when you're, when you got too much angst, the brain just seizes up and your executive functions, your ability to think and feel go offline. Right. So that's the first thing you do with these retreats is you get people to just settle in. And then I usually do like, so I usually have a theme. So the retreats are four times a year, winter, spring, summer, fall. And I align them with, it's sort of a lifestyle about how to work with the energy of that season, what foods you should eat, how to take care of your body through that season. And then I usually have a theme. So the last one was in the spring and that was my renewal. And my theme was, oh, we did um, spiritual detoxing and purification. Ooh. So the meditation, the opening meditation was working with a column of light and using a column of visualizing a column of light. So second thing is most people don't know what it feels like to feel relaxed. They don't. Most people carry a lot of tension and it's so habituated, they don't even know until they go like, oh my God, my neck is killing me. And, you know, that neck probably was killing them, you know, three months ago, but they're just noticing it. Wow. Wow. You know? Yeah. But yeah. so, so learning how to... um relax your body is the so I use breath relaxation so I do a visualization meditation and in that one because we were more sometimes we we're working more in lower conscious I work with states of consciousness so this was a spiritual one so it's a higher state of consciousness so we really played with um, an angelic realm using you know angel protection 
as one of the, the principles to guide safety. So another piece is that most people don't know how to feel safe inside themselves. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you just said and what that means? So, you know, most people can use um, some divine um, icons like angels or saints or uh, from Christian would be Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha. And for centuries, people have used divine icons as a, a focal point yeah. to occupy the mind so that the mind can have something to do while you're feeling and opening up to your own inner divinity. Mm-hmm. So back to the self, that's our inner divinity. You know, we are good in nature. We are good people. All of us have a real deep goodness. So because the spring one was about spiritual detox and spring is often a good time to detox your body. That's why we clean our houses. That's why a lot of people go on diets after the winter. <laughs> like we do this already, but people aren't really mindful of why we do what we do. And then, the, so I start with a visualization and then we open up the circle. And that's where people just sort of start to talk about why they're there, why, what they want out of the day. And we get sort of a lay of the land of the group and it becomes a way that people start to be real. So another thing is people aren't real with other people anymore. Yeah. You know, we yeah. got these things and, wow. you know, we're real. Yeah, Celia just held up her phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have those phones. Computers and phones. Yeah, we're all at the store looking down on our phones, not looking at each other. And people don't relate anymore. And if yeah. they, they don't relate from a real, real place. And often people only become real like when they're in a therapist's office. Yeah. But, you know, we're not supposed to be the people who people have real relationships with. We're supposed yes. to be helpers to help people have real relationships. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So the group, the group modality in a retreat starts to have people be able to be real from the inside. Mm-hmm. So there's not fluffy talk. I mean, there's fluffy talk, you know, at breaks and lunch and stuff like that. But we're talking about really being real. Mm. And it begins with that. It begins with that. You have people drop down into their bodies, do this beautiful meditation, really turning inside. And then we do the, you do the check-in. Right. And then after that, I usually do a movement. And I um, had formal um, Qigong, Tai Chi, and martial arts training for about 15 years. Wow. And so I often do very simple, simple Qigong movements or Tai Chi movements because when you move the body and the bo- once the body's relaxed, most people don't have never learned to move their body and feel relaxed at the same time. So that's pretty much what, you know, the morning and then there's process time where people... Okay, come. wait, I want to hear about moving the body. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. tell me what that means. Okay, so like we can even just do a very simple, simple movement. You can do it sitting down. Most people who have ever heard of uh, Tai Chi or Qigong, which m- many people have not, but if you're a yogi, uh, Qi is a similar to prana. So that's life energy. That's all that means. Chi is life energy. Prana is life energy. And so often in Tai Chi or Qigong, you have a Chi ball. So if you just put your hands close together, your own body starts to emit like a heat and an energy field. You can start to feel. So people just put their hands together and then just start to play with it where you're just feeling that energy, right? You feel I say it's kind of weird. Yes, I totally feel it. I actually feel like there's something in between my hands. Exactly. Almost like two magnets, you know, yes. when you put two magnets together, right? Yes. So that's your, that's your own energy. And, and one of the things that I loved about my training as a martial artist was I learned a lot about energy. So the energy of other people, my own energy, how to redirect energy, how to have energy for survival. Yeah. (laughs) Well, people talk about that, right? They walk into a room and they feel like, ooh, there's like yucky energy or it's awkward or I feel uncomfortable. And sometimes we don't even know why that is. Or you've learned as a child, if you grew up in a violent home, 
you knew that that energy was dark. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get to, if, if you're really aware, you get to read that in other people. So most people know how to read energy. They just don't know that they know how to do it. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you go back to your chi ball and you can like expand that ball, you can play with it. You can just get it. And what you want to do is just see if you could just relax your fingers and your wrist and let that ball just extend and move and then just slow it down. And so one way is to just bring it up from your lower, if, if, my, if it's down by your lower dantian, right, two inches by your navel. I'm just going to back up a tiny bit. And then you can just bring it up and open up, look up gather sky energy, right? And then bring this back down and come right down. And then towards the floor, you're gonna just bring your palm down, scoop up earth energy, and now bring it back up. And so one of the things that I learned as a martial artist was that human beings stand between heaven and earth. So we're gathering sky energy, energy from the cosmos, and then we're bringing it down, and then we're gathering earth energy. So you gather earth energy. And, you, and this is just moving meditation. Like Some people cannot sit on the cushion without their mind going 100 miles an hour. But movement is another concentration practice. So if you're going, I'm scooping up energy from the earth and I'm bringing it up and I'm opening myself up to the sky energy and I'm gathering sky energy and I'm bringing it down. Now, match your breath. Remember those deep, slow breaths? So your breath comes in and as you come down, exhale. Now, if you really want to add something, you can add that column of light. So you can imagine you're, you're inhaling, you're gathering that healing light, and now you're bringing it down, and you're gathering grounded earth energy. And then after you do that, you can come back to your ball, and now bring that right down into your belly, two inches below your navel, into your center, into your sea of vitality. That's your energy center. And here you can just set an intention. What's my intention? You can have an intention for the day, for the moment, for people you love, for your own healing capacity, for those parts of ourselves that work really, really hard for us. And you could just give that part of ourselves energy so you're cultivating energy and healing instead of cultivating what we were habituated our pain yeah yeah that was beautiful that was beautiful i feel so calm and connected in my body i feel like i can i'm so aware of like my toes all the way up to like my forehead i'm just in this calm it feels really beautiful um, before we get back to the retreat in the, pro the process of the retreat, I want to talk about what you just said. I can give that energy to the parts that are working so hard for me. Yes. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, I think parts are often, um, if we were to put them on a developmental timeline, they come at, at various times of our experiences. So, um, and develop, depending on, say, the age of the part. Like, so in IFS, we often ask, like, where do you feel this part in your body? What age is it? What kind of job does it do for us? So we do all this ex exploratory work. But often, there's missing experiences in our parts. So one of the attachment needs is reassurance, which gives us soothing and calm. So if we're not, so this could be a way that we soothe ourselves. So that part of ourselves that has a missing experience of being soothed and calm. So let's say it's a tantruming, angry little girl part 
Well, no one probably regulated her. No one probably ever said, sweetie, take some breaths. Look at me. Yeah. Let's just breathe together, right? And so that part that we have to do that for ourselves. When if it didn't happen in childhood, that train has left the tracks. Yeah. But we have to learn how to do it ourselves. So it's sort of like, you know, this part works really hard for me. It's saying, I don't like the way things are. I want things to be different. But you can't make things different until you calm the child, right? Right. It's funny as you're talking because I'm thinking, you know, my little girl temper tantrum parts, usually I either have parts that feel mad at her or ashamed of her. So she doesn't get a lot of soothing. She gets anger or, or sort of, you know, locked in the basement. Like Dick likes to say, you know, we sort of lock her in the basement. So, so there's other parts that have come on board. They might be older parts. They might be what we call negative interjects in the psych- psychology field which are taking on the energy of our primary caretakers. So we do to ourselves what our primary caretakers did to us. So that's what I'm saying about the missing experience for calming and soothing. And until you feel it in your body, you can say, okay, calm down. Okay. All right, Tammy, calm down. All right. It's, it's not a bad thing. Calm down, right? Take a <laughs> breath. <laughs> Take a breath, right? But until you slow everything down and you actually feel what calm feels like, Mm. there's no frame of reference. Right, right, right. Intellectually, everybody knows I have to calm down. And when they can't do it because they don't know how to make themselves feel that, they go, okay, give me a benzodiazepine. Give me a medicine. Give me a pill because that's the only way I'm going to survive this. Or it's the seed of addiction too. I was going to say, or give me all the brownies. Exactly. Oh, yeah. My favorite thing is like, there's nothing better than a good loaf of bread. <laughs> right, that'll calm you down real quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give me those carbs. Yeah. Carbs, carbs yeah. and sugar. Well, and I think that's why you're saying that's the first thing you do on these retreats is you're teaching the ability to be calm. And that's almost the cornerstone of the whole thing. It's a cornerstone, but it's really the beginning. Right. So then the magic happens in the interaction. Yeah. Talk about that. People. So, so usually we do a couple movement exercises, maybe some drawing. And then um, right now I do them out of my house. So I'm cooking lunch. <laughs> so while I'm cooking lunch. I have a craft. And that's a socialization time for people just to sort of be doing something like they made, um, I call them mobiles of change. And they made these mobiles that they had different objects that represented their, what they wanted to shift in their life experience. And then they made a little mobile. So there's that socialization time. And then we have lunch and then we do, uh, we go for a walk because it's all about nature. So we go Mm -hmm. either to a beach or to the woods and we go for a walk. And then in the afternoon, I do what I call healing sessions. And that's one-on-one work within the group context. So it's like really opening, like the brave people who say, I want to uh, work on something. When one person does work, they're doing the work for everyone. And often I'll use the group as sort of a holding environment or maybe even human props to like give them the missing experience, like a certain touch or a certain words that they say to the people so that, or the person doing the work. And I'm guiding the process and it's very much like an IFS session. Like that's where some of the IFS work, doing parts work working with the angry little girl or the sad little boy or whatever. And then the group becomes the safe holding container. And most people have not grown up in a family where it's been a safe container, where you could be expressing who you are or your pain and you're supported and you're loved no matter what and um, held. And so, so the healing sessions, there's usually one or two. And then we end with a guided meditation and a pro- and a, a, another you know lots of group processing and you know might even do some artwork and then we end with a you know with a guided meditation that sort of seals the day. So back up a little bit and tell me about so you're working with one person in the middle of the group 
um, or it, it, in the context yep. of the group. Mm-hmm. And then are other people kind of acting at sort of externalizing parts or are other people kind of being with the person in the way they needed? Tell me about what that looks like. It could, it could be any of that. So because it's so um, in the moment, and I don't know what the person's going to talk about. Do you know what I mean? I don't know where yeah. that process is going to go. It might be, you know, taking over that negative voice. So say like there's a part that's like, you never do it right. You never do it. So instead of the person saying inside their head, you say, you never do it right. I would take that over. So Tammy, okay. tell me how that part t- t- tells you that. Yeah, you never yeah. do it right. So t- no, tell me exactly you never do it right. Okay, I'm going to take over that. Okay, you never do it right. What happens in your body? You never do it right. I'm taking over that part. You're an act as if you're that part that tells me you never do it right. You're so stupid, blah, 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 blah. And then you're going you're gonna to embody that part of mine. Right. Or, or not embody it. Just use the words that, oh, okay. that, that you say to yourself. Okay. So that you can have a little bit of distance because sometimes our parts take us over, right? We get, right. Um, what's the word? I'm blended. It. Blended, right. So we get blended. So we're, that's an unblending technique. Yeah. Another one was I had one woman one time who was feeling very burdened by all of life stress. So I have these, you know, yoga bolsters. They're just, you know, but little pillows, square pillows. So I said, put your arms out and tell me, you know, a burden. So she tells me a burden. I put a pillow on. Tell me another burden. Tell me another burden. Tell me another burden. And it's like, this is what you're carrying. Wow. Like, this is how much you walk around in life with. Mm. Wow. And so then it's the learning is how do we let go? And how do we let other people help us? Mm. Let me take one off. Do you know what I mean? I'll take one off for you. Wow. Someone who has to always do it to have this group of people taking one off, that's healing right there. That's what you mean by the community being able to heal. Right. So and it's a gestalt or experiential learning. And all of my psychosynthesis training was doing this type of work. The woman I trained with was a master, master therapist. She's now deceased. She really was a, a, a mentor and probably the person that I strive to be as a therapist. She was such a wonderful human being that helped me with my own healing, working with parts in this way. Wow. So the experiential learning can be really, really powerful um, for people who want a different type of work. I also think, and this is what I, I joke with the, my, I have a little group of people who come all the time. I actually think this kind of model is much more powerful than individual therapy. Mm. Like you can probably get like six weeks to a, you know, two months of therapy in one day. Yeah. Why do you think that might be? Because I think it hits all layers of experiencing. So like how to be inside, how to work with your body, how to regulate your emotions. So it's being inside, but then it's being connected to others from my inside. Right, right. And individual psychotherapy, it's just me and you, but you got to go out in the world and kind of figure it out. Right. So there's that whole experiential. And then there's, then there's the invitation to have a different lifestyle than, you know, to be able to do practices instead of eat the donuts or zone out in front of television or have that glass of wine every night. Yeah. Tell me about practices. So the breathing practices, the visualization meditation practices, the Qigong practices. So usually when people come, the practices that I teach that day, they get a packet and they go home and they have the, they have the different practices that we do that particular day. Right. So then you have this amazing like immersement therapy and then you give them, not only do they practice it in their body, but you give them this tool that they can practice that because they're going to want more of that, right? They felt that relaxation. They're, they felt that connection. They're going to leave and want more and more of that. Right. And practices, 
it's that's it's it's exactly what it means. Like just because you do something once doesn't mean you're going to learn how to be relaxed after like at one day or you know an hour of a uh, visualization. <laughs> right. It's like it's like it's like we have these deep grooves of our negativity. And this is just an invitation to something different. But yeah. you got to practice that and practice that and practice that until it takes hold. And when it takes hold, again, just like EMDR, there's a juxtaposition. I have a choice to go down the rabbit hole or I can open up to something new and feel good. Right. That makes a ton of sense, right? Our parts, thinking of that in part language, our parts are used to acting a certain way. If you know, I get upset about something, then my part you know takes over and says, "Eat the bread or eat the brownies or whatever." Like that's the, the right dance that my system is so used to. It's used to that dance, and the part doesn't know any other way. Yeah. So yeah. it's that's the working hard. It's like eat the donut, Tammy. Eat the donut yeah. because you're gonna you're not gonna have to feel all that angsty stuff inside. Yeah. And there's nothing better than a good carb sugar thing to like <laughs> down it, you know, to dumb down that intensity. But the part does the part, that's what I mean by parts work really hard for us. They're so just trying to help us trying to get through that moment. So I think when, when we hang up from here, I'm going to do that, the hand motion, because my part of me that wants to eat all the donuts is really up right now because you keep talking about it. <laughs> So let me ask you, what does that part need? <laughs> Seriously, other than a donut, what does uh, it really need? Okay, yeah. let, me, let me see. Yeah, just check in. Just Maybe just take a couple breaths just to go inside. What I'm hearing is it needs me to slow down. Okay, great. Great, great, great. So just, just hold that for a sec, yeah. Just... Let that part know that you really appreciate that message. And as you bring your hand to your chest, what does your hand want to say to that part right now? I want to say thank you. My, my hand is saying thank you because it's, you know, when I, when I do eat the thing, it is what slows me down because I stop and eat. Right. Oh, so I'm saying thank you. Like, thank you for working so hard to get me to slow down. Right. I really get how you're trying to help me. Right. And we could do a whole process why you need to slow down, but just for the sake of time and the call. So, you know, just say we did a little bit of process and then I'd ask the part, would you be willing to do something different to help me slow down in a different way than eating the donut? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes this work is so weird, right? So what I just heard is I'm going to knock, like knock on the door inside of you. Like I'm going to knock. Mm -hmm. You're going to have, you're, I'm going to just knock. That's what I just heard. Okay. So it's going to give you a different warning signal. sign. Yeah. It's going to give you a signal. Beautiful. Beautiful. Can you feel that knock inside? I can. It actually feels like in my chest right now. It's not, it's not bad or hurtful. It's just a, a signal. Yeah, it's a signal. Okay. So, at, so let's just play with this for a second. And this is, you know, there's a whole process that we would go into the who, what, where, how, why, the parts there and all that other stuff. But let's just say you need a quick and dirty shortcut, right? So you okay. could say, let me try that movement and let's see if that helps slow me down and see how the part likes that. It really likes that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I would, at this point, I don't know if we have the time, but at this point, I would direct you to uh, do the movement now so the part feels what it feels like. Because it's. I'm going to do it, time or whatever. Right. <laughs> I think because this part is little and it liked the movement because it was fun and I was smiling and I'm a little bit giddy while we're doing it. And so I think the part was like, yeah, that was fun. Like that was play. And, and that's what children need, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what do we do with children? We go, yes, you're having a temper tantrum or you don't want it that way. And, you know, you need to slow down. And instead of going like, yeah, you're right. We need to slow down. We need to slow down. But you know what? How about if we do this over here 
and that's what that's what we do to children. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to guide children from their negative states and into a better state of mind and being. Yes. Um, and then then we teach them, wow, that was really hard on you. And when that happens again, maybe we could do this, right? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yes. So that might be fun, Tammy, for you to practice. I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm not messing around. That's <laughs> I'm going to do that tonight and tomorrow. (laughs) Well, practice, practice, practice. I will. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. So before we close, I'm curious if you were not a therapist and doing all those zillions of things that you do, what would you do? I know this sounds really silly, and I probably would not really like to do this, but my fantasy has always been to be a florist. (laughs) I love flowers. I love to arrange flowers. I just am at awe with like the beauty, like the beauty of different flowers. I'm going to show you my flowers that my husband got me. Oh my God. See how incredible they are. Incredible. They're so gorgeous. They are orange. And yellow roses, and these, these are beautiful. Oh, do you know what these things? I don't even know what they are. It looks like it looks like a hydrangea. Is yeah, that's a hydrangea, the little white. And I can never, yeah, that's a hydrangea. Those are roses, and um, are those a uh, that oh, looks either a mom or a Gerber daisy? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. And then um, those the, those look like a little bachelor button. It could be something else, you know, that I don't know. And then I never, I, that one, the orange one, I can never pronounce, pronounce it, but it starts with an A. It's like astronomous or something. I can't ever say it, but. Wow. All right. I'm going to take a picture of that and put it up somewhere on the Facebook page so everyone can yeah. look at my amazing flowers. Yeah. So I grow flowers, but, you know, I'm, I don't really have a lot of time to get in my gardens, but, um. But I, you know, I like to cut like before one of my favorite things now that we're getting into the growing season is before I start my job, I go, you know, before I start seeing clients, I go outside and I pick flowers and I have them in my office. And I love that because it's just such a grounding and I just love the beauty. Yeah, right. And it's amazing to get outside, walk outside, put your feet in the grass, get your hands around the flowers and slowly cut the whole process right it's like making tea the process is very grounding and yeah Yeah. well thank you so much for this if people want to hear about your retreats or find out more about you what's the best way to get in touch so um the retreats to learn about the retreats and to register for a retreat um the website is www.replenishhealingretreats.com Great. And I'll put that in the show notes too. And then to know about me, I have my own uh, professional website, celiagrand.com. And then if people, you know, I was interviewed um, out of the cable station in Biddeford. They had a show called Issues That Matter. And there's a two one-hour segments. And the first segment is about what is trauma. And I go pretty in-depth in depth about um, event and developmental trauma. And then the second hour is about the different treatments for trauma. And how can people find that? I'll, I'll look and see if it's, I- it's, uh, it's on my website and it's, on under, website. Okay. It's, uh, it's under the link of like training and consultation or teaching and consultation. Okay. And they're, and they're right there. They're right there. Great. Thank you. And, so and or you can go on YouTube and just go interview with Celia Grand. Okay. Perfect. Celia, thank you for everything. This was beautiful. Uh, Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for having me. And it's so exciting um, what you're doing. And I really think the community is just going to just embrace and love you because you have such a beautiful presence. I really think you're doing a great thing for the uh, IFS world. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFSTammy. 
and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.